Hello and welcome to this presentation entitled, When Will My Package Arrive? Using Machine Learning to Learn Business Logic. To shortly introduce myself, my name is Simon. I work as a data scientist at Poston. I have a background mostly as a software developer, but the last four years I have specialized more within data-driven solutions, working as a data scientist, including the last two years at Poston, where I mostly work with predicting delivery times for shipments. Most data-driven solutions involve a pre-processing pre step where you need the help of domain experts to explain the data so it can be reinterpreted to solve a specific case. If one is lucky, you might only need quite easy algorithms to later make a robust solution. However, this unfortunately puts a lot of requirements on the one creating the solution to understand and remember all information from the domain expert as to not make any mistakes while cleaning and translating the raw data. It can, be quite, it can become quite overwhelming at times. And in my presentation today, I will tell you about how we at Poston are trying to avoid this, avoid memorizing and transforming according to complex business logic by using instead complex algorithms that uh, can be applied to the data in its more raw state. So a little bit short introduction to the current solution and the work that we do now. And it's really as simple as this. We try to predict the duration from um, sender until the package arrives at its recipient. We solve this the way that most probably will try to solve it by getting a data set that maps certain preconditions and factors to an observed transit time for the shipment. And then we just fit a model to this data set. Sounds easy enough and achieving good results was not very hard as well. Today we estimate with over 80% accuracy the delivery date from the moment our production starts. We struggle mostly with predicting uh, delivery times in northern Norway because there are a lot of external factors there that have an influence, as well as if uh, the recipient is in a more uh, low densely populated area because then there is less data also, as well as the delivery patterns might not be as fixed. But otherwise also maybe periods of holidays can be a little bit challenging. Uh, preferably, we also want to update the recipient during the voyage of the package, trying to re-estimate the delivery dates uh, as we collect more data, so we can notify them if we tr do think that the delivery date has changed. This we do by creating a data set that maps uh, shipments to different timestamp that, that represent an arrival at uh, different milestones within the production. I will explain more about these milestones later on. And from this data set, we then fit several models that are predict from a certain milestone the, the expected delivery date until it's at its recipient. Unfortunately, to the best of my knowledge, at least, there is no such data set in Poston. Um, if such a data set even exists, the raw data does not look anything like this, unfortunately. So it will probably be sitting in some specific department's IT system that no one else can access, and it's based on their own interpretation of the raw data. Uh, this is nothing that is unique for a big company like Poston. It's um, quite normal that different departments become different silos and they have their own, own business logic in some sense, working with the data. So for us to be able to solve the task in my team, we had to therefore create our own data sets. And as we use the help of the main experts. So what does the data look like? Uh, first, I'll give a little bit of a brief summary on how the actual data is collected within Poston. So you have a shipment, and what you have is some static information, you could say, connected to this uh, shipment. 
static information in the sense that it doesn't change during the transit time, which are, for example, its dimensions, weights, it has a destination uh, source. And during its journey, several events are captured, creating a sequence of events connected to each uh, shipment. Each event is composed of a lot of information, but uh, three of them, the more important, would be an event code, a postal code, and a timestamp. And together, these three components, they answer the three questions, what happened, where did it happen, and when did it happen? So only these three components give us quite a lot of information. Uh, it sounds then like there should be no problems going from this one, this raw data to a data set that we need for our specific case. Unfortunately, like most real world data sets, the data quality might not be the best. Uh, the sequence of events that happens to a shipment might not be very unique all the time, but there are many cases it should be similar to another one and it is not. This is mostly because in production, those that work in the terminals, rightfully they spend more time at trying to get the shipments out of the terminal than trying to make sure that I have a very clean data set. Uh, getting me a clean data set is not on their priority list. They might skip scanning some scanning points just to speed up the process. Uh, in a hurry, they might even use the wrong uh, scanning uh, scanning codes, or they have wrongly configured their PDA because to the wrong postal code because usually they work in another terminal, but today they are guest working at uh, one terminal. So it looks like some events are happening in a place where they aren't supposed to happen. So from here on, we really need people, domain experts that can explain to us, all right, how, how are we supposed to interpret the, the data so we see it correctly? So here is where the actual issue arises, and I'll explain and why trying to clean up all this mess becomes quite uh, overwhelming. Most people that work at Poston will give a very simplified explanation of how the production works and it will mostly be based on the following image where a sender notifies us that they have a package that they would like to send after that this package arrives at a first terminal this package then the package is sent forward to a second terminal which we will call the um, delivery terminal uh, distribution terminal sorry and from the distribution terminal, it is sent out to the recipients. And these are some of the milestones that we try to identify though in, our, in the raw data. And this is how our first model was, well, our first model was based on. At the time we were only working with one product which had fairly good routines, so it was not the biggest challenge to um, clean up the data. But the previous, this um, explanation of how a package tr transits is quite simplified. Um, there might be, there are a lot of events in between that might or might not be registered, even if they should be. Uh, for example, one is that the, the, the shipment should be registered to be loaded onto a truck before leaving the first terminal. So the first challenge is to define from what is our starting point? Where, where do we start to estimate time from, the, the transit time from? And uh, especially in B2B, the time between the sender no, that the sender notifies us that they have a shipment that they want to send until it arrives to the first terminal varies a lot. And this is very dependent on the customer itself because they might send us 
uh, today there is a shipment but they don't have it ready in their warehouse until tomorrow so we therefore don't take responsibility really of this this uh, period of time so we say we predict from from the first terminal because this is where our production starts but identifying a terminal in the sequence of events is just one big challenge by itself even though the terminal network is quite static, a single postcode is in, uh, in Norway is only linked to one terminal. The problem is that a reliable data set over our terminals does not, does not even exist. So we don't know for sure what if an event really occurred at a terminal or not. The definition of some events are quite fuzzy and there are over 100 of them. Some imply that they should only happen at a terminal, but can occur at any of them at the chain, so either the first one or the second one. But if we, well, how we saw that in the beginning was that if we sort on the timestamps, we could guess that okay, the first that first event should be when it arrived at the terminal, and the second event that might should happen at a terminal should be at the distribution terminal. But then you have cases where some customers for some different services are able to just drive uh, their uh, goods all the way to the distribution terminal right away, just going past the first terminal. So in these special cases, we have to try and find some fictional event or some substitute event that might be uh, a better start, start event for the production. And then, yeah, when exploring the data, you find that there are actually a lot of different milestones that are quite uh, important as well. Ex for example, if the recipient is too far away from the distribution terminal, there's usually a dip, short for distribution point, in between. So the package will go from the second terminal to the distribution point, then be delivered out to the recipient. And if it's another product like B2C, then we don't even go out to the actual customer and uh, to the recipient and deliver it if it's not home delivery. But then we do go to um, PIB, Post e boutique where the recipient needs to go and collect their package. And then we count as the arrival at the Post e boutique as the delivery moment because there we cannot take responsibility over how long will it take for the recipient to go and collect their package at, at the PIP? They might wait a couple of days or whenever they get off work. And then for very, very small customers that uh, or businesses, or if it's the C2C, they might go to, then the sender has to go to a post boutique to send their package. And then they then we have to redefine that as the starting point for the whole process. And at this point, you have had the talks with uh, four or five different domain experts. Usually it's one per product service that we have. And when you finally get nailed down for how it works for domestic parcels within Norway, you're told that you have to start predicting how Sweden and Denmark does it, and which have their own processes and own systems. And then the anxiety and feeling of overwhelmness starts. Uh, by this point, you need very good knowledge of the production process and the, ex the different ex exceptions that can arrive, um, that can occur within them. You need to ha know how to code this to make a new data set that is clean that you can fit your model to. And it has to be pretty uh, low on mistakes, to say the least. And you need to be pretty good at creating a machine learning model that will actually deliver good results, because that's what you're trying to do in the end. Uh, internally, we cannot even always agree on how we should perform this pre-processing step. And it was getting increasingly difficult for everyone to stay up to date and understand what was it how did we actually do this? So when you only need to deal with one product at a time, it's 
manageable, it works. But the more services that were added and the more uniqueness that was added, the amount of work that just kept piling up to try and support this just grew insignificantly big. It grew significantly big. Uh, these services also change over time, the process changes, and then the data changes, and then you also have to keep up to date to uh, the, your code to make sure that your pre-processing steps takes all of this into account. So we took a step back and tried to search together on what we do differently. How, how can we avoid this? Uh, because we we were realizing we were spending an enormous amount of time coding these data sets and it was uh, getting out of control on how to try and get, make sure that they were um, all correctly interpre interpreted as well. So the idea was we wanted to minimize the amount of work, amount of pre-processing to the, the minimum uh try and work with the data in this more raw form make the machine do the work for us our main idea was to stop transforming the data to fit our needs and instead predict using the original data and then transform the prediction instead to something an answer to our problem so instead we want to create a model that's based on this that is just the event of sequences. And we would like to try and predict these event of sequences for each shipment. So we spend less time as trying to understand these events, what they mean, what they have as influence on the production, and instead just mainly try and create these sequences of events for each shipment. So we had to take quite a few steps back and look at what kind of data, data we were really sitting on. Uh, we had been so goal-oriented before that when we were transforming the data, we didn't really realize what was it exactly that the raw data was and signif um, signified. So the more and more we thought about it, the more we kind of understood that these events actually more or less tell the journey of a shipment. So here we have, for example, that at 10 in the morning, the 2nd of May 2022, we are notified that the sender wants to send a package. Two hours later, the shipment arrives at the Oslo terminal. At 17, the shipment is loaded onto the truck to the next terminal. The next morning, it arrives at the terminal in Kristiansand, and it's delivered at 11 at the same day. And this is based on those three components for each um, each event. And what we did think of is that these events, it's pretty much like uh, they are like words, sentences that describe this odyssey of the, the shipment. And you can see this as a whole, like a language that the production speaks. So instead of us, trying to sit and figure this out in this language. We put the machine to try and do it for us. <laughs> and uh, well, we did much more important things. We took inspiration then from text generation problems. And what really, what we took most inspiration from that we thought fitted our uh, problem the best was image captioning models. So these models can differ quite a lot in how they're implemented, but usually they have uh, in common that they are based on an encoder-decoder structure. And <clears throat> what, what you do is you feed the encoder with an image and it produces a context vector that is fed to the decoder and with in combination of a start token, which is usually a, a fictional token and then the encoder starts to output um, the, the decoder starts to output new new words from that and each output is later then fed back into the decoder to produce the next step 
at each time. And this is done recursively until the decoder outputs a stop stop token that just is also a fictional token that says end of end of text. So this fits our problem quite well because these uh, it's we have like a certain context and we want to generate a, more, a kind of a descriptive text about what's going to happen to this shipment. Uh, these models also have built in that they output um, sequences of variable lengths. So in our cases, we um, a shipment that goes that is uh, in the same fylke, so it uh, has the same terminal. Might, well, it's going to have shorter sequences. One that goes further away has some some issues on the way. It's going to register a couple more events. And it also has built in that more data you collect or you give it, the more it, it's always predicting the end of the sequence or the, the rest of the sequence. So you can start at the start token, but you can also start give it the first five events and then keep going. So this is our, so we kept this encoder decoder structure. <clears throat> Excuse me, where we feed it with uh, static information, auxiliary information about the shipment, like its dimensions and weights, its uh, source and destination, and give it the encoder outputs and encoding that together with the start token, we start generating a sequence of events until we get a stop event. And uh, the only difference is that instead of using natural language words, we use events. So for the curious one, I added uh, a little bit of the architecture of how our current model that we are experimenting with it might not be 100% correct, but it's about this, like this it looks. So this image is the encoder part and it takes four inputs or four different kinds of inputs, which are the from and to. They are uh, postal codes, so they go through embedding layers. There's also, uh, at the bottom, you can see white, uh, weight and dimensions that go together through a dense layer. And then there's also a time component. Um, the, um, there are seasonal effects that we need to take into account, for example, during holidays. Uh, we also have to know if we're starting on a Friday, so we can take into account the weekend. So the output of each one of these uh, layers are concatenated together, and then they go through a compression together, encode, encoding step through multiple dense layers. And out we get the first hidden state. To, uh, so the decoder is built on LSTM layers, and the output of the encoder is then used as the first hidden state for the first LSTM layer of the decoder. Um, based on a couple layers of LSTM and a couple layers of dense layers. And then here comes a little bit of the tricky part. So when uh, when you do image captioning, for example, you output a sequence of words. Sequence and words are just one one value. And usually, you you put these words through an embedding to create an embedding vector. Um, but in our case, we have uh, a word is three components. You could say then a, a postal code, which is the location, a, a timestamp, and um, an event code that describes what what happened. So first things first, uh, as time is continuous and growing, then we have to have to change the definition of time for the event, and we do it as uh, we represent it as the duration between the current event and the previous event. And so when we predict the next next event, we also predict in how long time it's going to happen. So these three components need to be uh, go through their own each input layer, 
to together be concatenated and then encoded through some dense layers. And then the encoder of our, the, uh, the decoder that predicts the, um, the event sequence, it actually only works with these uh, encodings of the events. So it, it predicts a sequence of encodings of events and each of these are then respectively uh, decoded into their respective three components then so the event code and the location and the duration from the previous event bit tricky but uh, also for clarification so you can see that the, the input for the encoder comes from the left and we input uh, events from the bottom to produce output events on the right side. So, and what you could see is, so if we, here you, we, I marked out what is the encoder part and what is the decoder part. And you can see there's some extra, and if you see it as two different models, you could actually say that we kind of have four models here where there are two more. One takes care of encoding the event information, and one takes care of of um, deco decoding the event information later on. And and this together they actually form an autoencoder that we pre-train before training the encoder decoder structure. Also, <clears throat> so. Uh, let's round this uh, off uh, with some last thoughts and reflections from my side. So everything is still in a very experimental phase. Uh, we have mostly been just focusing on one product and trying to be able to well predict its its a, a sequence of events. I, I unfortunately don't have any results that I can share at the moment, but we've done some preliminary tests and they have actually shown a lot of promise. What we that we are very happy about. So uh, in many cases we can we can predict uh, quite well the entire sequence of events and uh, where they're going to happen. And uh, without uh, much um, uh, error also to the duration between the events. So retroactively this makes you feel that maybe the data quality is not that poor. The machine managed to actually make sense of it, but we humans maybe just it was too overwhelming for us but uh, that's in my opinion what machine learning is uh, meant to to handle what uh, the human mind cannot so we never expect really to gain uh, improvements to the results with this test it was actually just meant to to make our lives easier and we were hoping that at least we keep the same quality in our predictions so, but uh, we we saw that we actually keep the same quality as before. Uh, we have equally good predictions with this new model, and but we can also do much much more with it. To list some of the pros, right? Then uh, we we managed to make we strongly believe in this idea, and and we managed to make something that is uh, based. That someone can work with but even with very limited knowledge about logistics within Poston. so which is a, a huge plus and it makes it easier to incorporate new new products later that we don't have to spend the enormous amount of time trying to understand them and how they work uh, it's a much more versatile model it has built in that it can just keep predicting the, uh, the next parts of the sequence all the time so continuous updates are built into this and lastly it also can be used actually as a tool to um, to predict to explain the data to us it managed to make sense of it out of it and uh, we could actually see how when um, it, it has learned the typical uh, behavior within production and when you get things that it cannot predict well, it means that it, we find anomalies within production, which are very interesting to identify. However, of course, there are some cons with this. We managed to reduce the complexity in understanding the data, but we uh, certainly raised the complexity in how our model looks like. And 
raised the requirements in understanding machine complex machine learning algorithms. Maybe not everyone enjoys this challenge as much as I do creating these uh, complex solutions. We also noticed there was a higher sensitivity to production changes. So uh, when our previous model was very based, was very sheltered from how production works, but what we, and th therefore when there were production changes, this was already kind of not filtered out from the data and the model could still uh, predict quite well. But this new one is much more sensitive to it. So it uh, it needs to be a more, we have to look into how we can update it uh, with, how often do we have to update it with new data, refit it to have it up to date to production changes. And last of all, I will just finish by saying, this is a solution that worked for us. It might not absolutely work in all cases. Uh, at Poston, we are blessed with a lot of data so we can do these solutions, uh, which we are very happy for. But uh, one of the reasons you do pre-processing is that if you don't have the data for it, you need to kind of help the machine on the way to uh, with what it can figure out by itself. So. All right, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you send my way. Thank you very much, bye.